In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make this game with JavaScript using a library called p5.js and a library I wrote for p5.js called Tile Renderer. Now, Tile Renderer, you can use it with any tile set you want from the internet, but it's especially useful if you want to use a website called levellevel.com. So we're going to be building a map with that. So first in levellevel.com, we're going to create a new project. I'm going to make it 25 by 25, but you don't have to make your map exactly the same way I'm making it. We're using the C64 Petsky tile set. This is all the default options, but this is important. We're going to disable tile rotation and disable tile flipping because my library doesn't actually support that. And I'll explain why later. Okay. We need to get rid of the background color for the layer because my library doesn't support that either. And I'll, and I'll explain why in a second. So to do that, we'll just double click on the layer in the corner here and we'll click on this color and we'll set it to transparent and we might as well set the border to transparent too, but that doesn't matter. And um, might as well name the layer. I'm gonna name it walls because I'm gonna draw some walls for our map. And now I'm gonna grab the rectangle tool and we're gonna start drawing some rectangles. And it really doesn't matter specifically how your map looks, but I'm just going to draw some walls and I'll just make it look nice. Okay, and on a new layer, I'm going to call this new layer interactive because we're going to put some interactive things on here. Again, we disable flipping and rotating tiles and our background color should be transparent. And I'll pick this green color and put some dollar signs. This is going to be money that the player will be able to collect. Now, I want to put a, a little player on the screen, but I don't have any tiles in my tile set that look like a player. So I can actually just draw one myself. So I'm just gonna make it this at symbol. It's a index, the index for this one is zero. So I'll click on that and then I'll go tiles, show tile editor in this menu up here. And then I can just start drawing. And so the tile editor is a way that you can go about rotating and flipping tiles. So like if I wanted to take this tile right here and rotate it, I can press rotate like that. I'm gonna close the tile editor and I'll put one just right there. And I'll take uh, like this cyan color and I'll put another little person right there. That'll be an enemy. And I'm gonna want the background to be this dark blue color. Now the reason my library doesn't support the background colors is because every single tile in your creation could have a different background color. So that would require the library to draw a rectangle for every single tile behind every tile, which would be really inefficient when it would be much better to just draw one giant rectangle behind your entire scene. So that is an intentionally unsupported feature. So we've got two layers, walls and interactive, and we're gonna export as a JSON file. So it's this one down here. I'll call this my map JSON, and we're gonna leave all of these to, de to the defaults. Okay. So I'm just gonna copy paste that file into the folder for my sketch. And so here's my sketch. I've got it open in the Atom editor. And you can see in the libraries folder, I've put our tile renderer.js. And in the index.html file, I've referenced that script right here. I'm going to load in our new JSON file using preload. I'll call it my map, my map JSON. Load it like that. And I'll also create a canvas. I'll make it 500 by 500 and I'll draw a black background on that canvas. And you can see the sketch over here. So now that I've loaded the JSON file, if I go into the JavaScript console here and I type my map JSON, you can see all the info for it there. Okay, so let's get our tile map on the screen. So to do that, I'm gonna create a tile renderer. This is from the library. So new tile renderer, and we need to give it the JSON object that we loaded in. We are gonna wanna create two graphics because we had two layers in our project. And the tile renderer library automatically loads up the layers that we created. So if I go to the console here, I can type my tile renderer and we can use a method called dot get layer. And then I'll just type in the name of a layer. So I have uh, my walls layer. So I type in walls. I'm going to make a variable called walls graphic and we're going to call my tile renderer dot get graphic. So this method takes three parameters and we can look in the documentation I wrote to see what those are. First parameter is a name. Second is the layer object I was talking about. 
And the third is a settings object, which I'll go over. So I can pick any name for this. I'm just gonna call it walls graphic. For the layer object, I'm gonna say my tile renderer dot get layer. And uh, the layer is called walls. And the settings object, we can just leave these at the default settings for now, but we will be changing the settings later. Now the walls graphic is not being displayed on the screen. That's because I need to call image. And the walls graphic is just a P5 graphic like any other P5 graphic. So I can just uh, put that as a parameter for image and I'll draw it at zero, zero. Now you'll notice it's still not appearing on the screen. The graphic is being drawn, but there's nothing in the graphic yet. And that's because we need to call the graphics update method. What my library does is it only draws the graphic a few tiles at a time. So you need to call the update method so that it will know when to add more tiles to the graphic. This is a better way to do it because if you tried to render all the tiles at once, it could really badly slow down your program. Now we can finally see the walls graphic on the screen and you can see that it rendered it about 10 tiles at a time because that's the default setting. Now I'll do the same for my other layer, which was called interactive. So interactive graphic equals my tile renderer dot get graphic. And I'll just name it interactive graphic. My tile renderer dot get layer interactive. And again, we need to call that graphics update method and draw it to the screen. So it's really small, but you can see we've got both of our graphics now. And I want the background color to be this dark blue color that I've got from levellevel.com. Well, the nice thing is that my library actually imports the color palette that you used. So if I type in the console here, my tile renderer color palette, we've got an array of 16 colors and each of these is a P5 color. So if I hover over the dark blue color, I can see that the index is six. So in background here, instead of drawing a black background, I can just say my tile renderer dot color palette and we want the sixth item in the array. Okay, now we've got our dark blue color and I'm gonna make this bigger on the screen and I also want it to be centered. So easy way to do that, I'll just say image mode center in my setup. We'll draw both images at the exact center of the screen. So I'll type width divided by two and height divided by two for the X and Y coordinates. But it's still really small. So what I'm actually gonna do is use P5 scale and I'll scale by a factor of two. But now you'll notice it's off center. So we need to fix that. So I'll actually just use translate translate to the center of the screen with divided by two, height divided by two, scale two, and then I'll change the X and Y coordinates of my image to be zero. Now we've got that in the center of the screen and it's nice and big, but it looks blurry. So to fix that, all we have to do is call no smooth in setup. Now I scaled this by two for a reason, because if you scale it by a decimal like one and a half, it's gonna look really janky. So if I take a screen cap of this, the way that the graphic was scaled looks all weird. So when you use no smooth on a pixel graphic like this, it does its best to shrink the image, but it still looks really clunky. So you need to scale by an integer, like a whole number, like one or two or three. So now we're gonna get our little yellow player at the top here moving around the screen. We're gonna make the player move with the arrow keys. So to do that, I'm gonna make a variable called player position, and it will have an X and Y coordinate. Now to get the X and Y coordinate, I could just go over to levellevel.com and hover over the player here. And I can actually see the X and Y coordinates at the bottom of the screen. I can see it says 12, two. So I know X is 12 and Y is two, but my library has a feature that can make this easier because let's say later I wanted to move this yellow player somewhere else on the map. I decide I like it better if the player starts out over here, or if you are building lots of maps, it would be nice if you could just have something that can automatically locate wherever you draw that character. So for that, we have a method called get tile. Oh, sorry, that's not right. No, we want locate character. We give it a character to look for and it will return the X and Y coordinates of that character. In level level, if I hover over my little person sprite, I can see that the index for that sprite is zero. So actually what I'll do here is I will say player position equals my tile renderer dot locate character. And we're looking for one with an index of zero. 
right? We've got an error because we don't want to use my tile renderer dot locate character. We want to use it on the graphic that our player is in. Interactive graphic dot locate character zero. Okay, so if in the console I search player position, we've got an array with two values in it. So why is that? Well, it's actually because we've got two tiles in this graphic that use that sprite. We've got a yellow one up here and a cyan one down here. So to only look for the yellow one, we can give locate character a second parameter, and that will be the index of the color in the color palette. So I can see in level level that the yellow color has an index of seven. So I'll just give this a second parameter, seven. And now when I call player position, it's an array with just one value because it only found one match. Now this isn't a, a pair of X and Y coordinates. This is actually the index of the tile. If you were to look at this map and read the tiles from left to right, like a book, left to right, top to bottom, this would be the 60 second tile in the map. So we can actually convert that with a handy method called index to coordinates. So first of all, I'm gonna set this to be the zeroth element in the player position array. And then I will say player position equals interactive graphic dot index to coordinates. And the index we want to convert is called player position. So this will convert player position into a pair of X and Y coordinates. So if I call it now, we can see it says X is 12 and Y is two, which is exactly what we saw over here. So let's make it so that when you press the arrow keys, the player position changes. So for that, I'm gonna write a new function called update player. And we're gonna call this in the draw loop. So I'll just call it like right there. And we're gonna create two variables that store the direction the player is moving in. So before we check anything, we'll just set these to be none. And then let's see if the player is holding down any arrow keys. So if key is down left, arrow, then horizontal direction equals left. Let's create a local variable called new player position. So this will be the position of the player after we move it based on what arrow keys are pressed. So to start, we're gonna have the X and Y coordinates set to just the X and Y coordinates of the player and then We'll change them based on what direction it's moving. And actually, these should be local variables too. So we'll say if horizontal direction equals left, then we want to decrease the x coordinate by one. So we'll say new player position dot x minus minus. And if we move right, we want to increase it by one. So we've got this new player position variable because that's gonna be useful for programming the collisions with the walls later. But for now, we're just gonna say player position equals, well, we're gonna set the X coordinate to the new position, the new X coordinate and the Y coordinate to the new Y coordinate. And you don't have to do this, but I wrote an extra function so that you can see what arrow keys I'm pressing for demonstration. But you'll notice that the player's not moving when I press the arrow keys. The graphic hasn't actually changed based on the player position, so we need to fix that. So at this new player position, we're gonna use a method called setTile. So we'll say interactive graphic.setTile. And at this new tile, well, we're gonna give it the X and Y coordinates of that tile, which is just the X and Y coordinates of the player. And if we look at the documentation, we can see it can take the X and Y coordinates and then the third property is the properties of the new tile. So that needs to be an object. So I'm gonna make an object called new tile properties. And this object is supposed to have three parameters, but we actually only need to have one of, one of them. The other two are optional. It needs to have the sheet index. And that is just the index of the character that we want it to be in level level. So again, when you hover over any tile in this tile selector thing, if I hover over my little person, that's an index of zero. So I'll say sheet index zero. And over here, we will just make that the third parameter in our set tile method. Okay, 
So now, when I press the arrow keys, you can see for one, it moves really fast, but also it's making this weird like trail because we're not clearing the old position where the character used to be. So we actually need to call set tile twice. We need to also call it uh, before the player position changes. So actually at the beginning of this update player function, I'll say new tile properties equals or sheet index. So what is the sheet index of the blank tile? Well, if I go here and I hover over the blank tile, it has an index of 32. And now this calls interactive graphic.set tile, set it at the player position before we change the X and Y coordinates to the new position. We want to set the old position to be blank. And uh, I think down here, uh, we don't wanna use let twice for the same variable. Okay, so now when I press the arrow keys, the old tile is disappearing, so it's not leaving a trail like before, but it's still moving really fast. And that's because this sketch is running at 60 or 70 frames per second. And so one way we could fix that is by calling, uh, setting the frame rate to like 10. So if I do that in the console, you can see now the player is actually moving at a reasonable pace. There are better ways to solve this problem, but that's how we'll do it just for the sake of this tutorial. Now the player has also turned white and that's because we didn't specify a color to set it to. So in levellevel.com, in our interactive layer, if I just only show the interactive layer, all these other tiles are blank, but you wouldn't know that the color of those tiles is actually set to white. So we need to specify that we want that yellow color. Another property of our object is called tile color and we will just put the index of the color we want it to be from the color palette so we type tile color and the yellow color has an index of seven and the player stays yellow and also I forgot we need to set the frame rate to 10 in setup so I'll go up to setup frame rate 10 now you'll notice that the entire map is actually rendering really slowly each graphic is only rendering 10 tiles per frame. So when it's running at 60 or 70 frames per second, that's fine. But when the frame rate is this low, we're gonna want it to render more tiles per frame. So to fix that, we can actually create some settings for our walls graphic and our interactive graphic. So I'm gonna call this map graphic settings. It'll be an object. And in the documentation, we can go up to get graphic. So we've got all these options for settings and we can include as many or as few as we like. But let's just worry about this one, tiles per frame. So we'll have a property called tiles per frame and we can set it to a much higher number than 10. So let's say like 60, let's see how that looks. Ah, it's not actually working yet because we need to make the our new settings object be the third parameter when we call get graphic. So I'm just gonna paste that here. And also for our interactive graphic, that renders much faster. Let's try 100. Now when the player moves off the screen, we get an error. The player can't have negative coordinates. That doesn't make any sense. It would just go off the screen. After we change the X and Y coordinates, we'll just quickly constrain them. Our map is 24 by 24. Constrain new player position dot X between zero and 24. Constrain new player position dot Y between zero and 24. Now if I move around, if I try to escape the map, you can see it doesn't let me. Now let's do collision with walls. We just use our variable called new player position and we just check on the walls graphic, we just check if there is a wall at that new position. And if there is, then we won't let the player move there. And if there is not, then we will let the player move there. And for that, we're gonna use a method called get tile. So here's get tile. We'll just give it the X and Y coordinates that we wanna check. In return, it will give us the sheet index of the tile at that position and also the color of the tile. But we're not interested in the color of the tile. We're just interested in whether or not it's a wall. Tile at new position equals walls graphic dot get tile new player position dot x new player position dot y and i'm actually going to create a function that checks whether or not there is a wall there so let's just call this wall at is a function and actually let's let's just give this function two parameters x and y and let's put this in that function 
So instead of checking that, we're just gonna check whatever parameters we give it. So if the tile at this position has a wall, then we return true. If it doesn't have a wall, then we return false. Well, what counts as a wall? We've got all these different tiles in our map. We've got these slanted ones, these solid ones. So we can actually just check whether or not the new tile is a blank space, which if you remember has an index of 32. So we say, if tile at new position dot sheet index equals 32, return false, otherwise return true. So now with our new function, we can say, if there isn't a wall at the new player position, so new player position dot X, new player position dot Y, if it is safe to move there, then that's when we're, we will set the player's position to this new, these new coordinates. So now we should see, yeah, if I try to move into the walls, it doesn't let me. So this is all well and good, but it's still not ideal because we've got a problem that I call sticky walls. So you'll notice if I press the left arrow, I bump into that wall. But now if I press the up or down arrows, it won't let me move up or down. It's trying to move me diagonally into the wall when what really should be happening is it should be letting me move up and down because there are spaces above and below me, but it's not letting me because it's checking the wrong tile. That's why I call, call it sticky walls. And it, this can be really annoying for players. And if you've ever had to play a game that does this, like an amateur made game, then you know what I'm talking about. That's why we update the horizontal position and the vertical position separately. So that's pretty easy to fix. Let's erase this and Let's first check whether or not there's a wall if we just change the X position. So we change the X, but the Y position stays the same as before. So we'll say player position dot Y. And if there is no wall there, then it's safe to change the X position. So we'll say player position dot X equals new player position dot X. And then let's copy paste this. Then we check the Y coordinate. So check the old player position dot X new player position dot y and if there is no wall there then the player's y position can safely be set to the new y position now if i press the left arrow while i'm up against this wall i can still use the up and down arrows so that'll be much less annoying the last thing we'll do is we'll put some text on the screen that says how much money the player has and also when the player runs over this little enemy it'll go up by say ten dollars so once again, we're gonna use get tile and we want to use get tile before we do any changing of what that tile actually is. So we're gonna say, uh, let's, let's call it new tile properties again. Interactive graphic dot get tile, player position dot X, player position dot Y. And we wanna check whether or not the tile is, is a money tile. So if I look on level level, the money tile has an index of 164. So if new tile properties dot sheet index equals 164, here's where we're gonna increase the money count. But for, for now, let's just console log player collected money. So when I go over these, we should see in the console here, it logs player collected money. Yep. There we go. Okay, so now I'm gonna go up to setup and we'll say player money equals zero, start off with zero dollars. And then back down here, when the player collects money, let's say player money plus plus, increase by one. Okay, so if I check in the console, player money starts off at zero. But now after I collect four of these, when I check player money again, it's now four. And let's make it so when you go over the enemy, you collect 10. So let's see, the enemy will have an index of zero, but we also wanna make sure that it's the tile with the cyan color. So the tile color, the index for that cyan color is three. So let's copy this. So the sheet index is zero and tile color is three. And if that happens, then increase by 10. Let's see if that works. So player money starts off at zero. We run over this little guy here and now, yep, player money is at 10. Now let's display that amount of money on the screen. 
So for that, we're gonna use a new method called getTextGraphic. We're done with this update layer function. I'm just gonna collapse that. And back in our draw loop, let's go, after we draw both of these graphics, let's draw a new graphic, money graphic. And so we'll say tile renderer dot get text graphic. So the first parameter is the text we want to display. So let's have it say money colon and then the amount of money the player has. Now the second parameter, let's look. The second parameter is the graphic settings object. Now, unlike before, this time the graphic settings object is actually required. Oh, it says optional here. I need to fix that because we need to specify what color to render the text. So let's call this money graphic settings text color and let's have it be that yellow color. So that has an index of seven and then I'll make that settings object the second parameter. Ah, it's a my tile renderer. Okay. So when I try to do that, we've got an, a warning. The, Get text graphic method requires the tile renderer to have a defined alphabet property. Now, why is that? Well, it's because if we go over to levellevel.com, it has a text tool here. And if we try to use the text tool, we'll notice uh, it works fine like normal for the lowercase letters, but when I try to type uppercase letters, it goes all haywire. Uh, the way the text tool behaves is actually different for every tile set. Let's, let's open a new project with a different tile set. Yeah, this one's the opposite. When you type capital letters, it actually puts in lowercase letters. And when you type lowercase letters, it just puts in a bunch of random symbols. So this text tool is pretty janky to be honest. But what I've done is I've ripped all the data off of this website for what characters correspond to what tiles, which again is different for every tile set. The tile renderer library doesn't know what tile set we're using. So we need to tell the tile renderer what we're using. So up here, when we create the tile renderer, we'll just say my tile renderer dot alphabet. We set the alphabet property to the name of the tile set. And we go to tiles at the top, choose a tile set. And we can see this one is called the Commodore 64. Commodore 64. And now when we run the sketch, we don't have that error anymore because it knows what tile set we're using, but we're still not seeing the text on the screen. After we create the graphic, we need to call update on it. So my graph money graphic dot update, and then we need to draw it. So let's use image to draw the graphic and let's just draw it at zero zero for now. Now we've got this random symbol here because you'll notice in the string that I gave it, we put in a capital letter. So I'll just change that to lowercase. Oh, and I wanna put a dollar sign next to that. So let me just type that. Now when I go and collect money, you can see that that graphic is updating, but there's a big problem with this. If we go into the developer tools panel, and instead of looking at the console, let's look at the elements. If I expand this, you can see we've got a ton of canvas elements and that's because P5 creates a new canvas element for every graphic you create, every P5 graphic. So if we count these, we shouldn't have like over a dozen like this says. I mean, we've got the two layers, we've got this one text graphic, so we should only have three really, uh, technically four. The tile renderer also has a sheet graphic that it just uses under the hood. So why do we have over a dozen canvases in our elements panel. The canvas is called auto-generated text graphic, and it's created a new one for every single time the text updates. And what we need to do is delete the old graphics when they become obsolete. All we have to do is at the beginning of our draw loop, we call my tile renderer dot set graphics to unused. And then at the bottom of the draw loop, go down here, say my tile renderer dot delete unused graphics. Every graphic has a property called used. For example, if I go in the console and I type walls graphic dot used, we can see it's set to true. It's used property gets set to true when we call its update method. At the beginning, every graphic is set to unused. And then as we go down the draw loop, as they get updated, the used property gets set to true. And then at the bottom of the draw loop, any graphics that haven't been updated just get deleted. So let's save that. And as you can see, 
the sketch still behaves the same as before. But now if we go to the elements panel, we only have four canvases even when I collect more money. And you can see this light up. That's because the canvas element is getting deleted and replaced with a new canvas element. It's not just leaving a bunch of canvases piled up. And that's important because when you have something like that in your JavaScript project, it can really slow things down. It's, it's called memory leakage. It could even, you know, completely freeze up or crash. But other than that, it looks like our game is done. So, Thank you for joining me and best of luck.